Let's move to the revolution itself of the 1970s. So Phillips curve was considered as inadequate concept because the model is static, uh, no dynamics, and uh, uh, what is missing in the basic formulation is the distinction between real and nominal wages, which leads to money illusion there, which is, however, hardly hardly accepted uh, or hardly um, hardly <clears throat> it's just hard to believe in in reality where the inflation rates is uh, one of the most uh, reported indicator of the of uh, of the economic conditions of a country. Furthermore, there's been a res uh, there's been recessions, oil shocks, and stagflations, which uh, during which the policy predictions were uh, were were missing uh, missing the the actual development, and the policies which were aimed to stabilize the economies, which were based on the previous frameworks, actually failed, according to the critics. Furthermore, uh, the new framework, which was already kind of available to models with rational expectations, provided very different implications, which kind of uh, seem to be in cons uh, consistent with, uh, with the experience of the 1970s. One of the example of the revolutionary uh, level, revolutionary models and uh, implications was the famous policy and effectiveness proposition by Thomas Sargent and Neil Wallace from 1975. Sargent and Wallace argue that with adaptive expectations uh, where the agents are only backward looking, uh, it is assumed that, uh, that, the, uh, that the agents in the economy, uh, such as firms or households, make systematic prediction errors. So if there is a ever increasing uh, inflation, they still expect for the next period the inflation lower than it uh, than it used to be, as if they won't be able to exploit the behavior of inflation to the future, which doesn't seem to be very plausible. So in their models, with racial expectations, the, where the agents are able to foresee uh, the, for example, the attempts of the government to manipulate uh, the output via changes in money supply, then these rational agents would expect higher inflation for the future and behave accordingly. So uh, they just adjust their expectations, they uh, uh, embed these expectations about higher future inflation into their negotiations about wages, and then the money illusion, which dries up uh, the output and lowers unemployment in the simple Phillips curve model just disappears. And uh, so we have two models, Keynesian models, new, new classical models with uh, rational expectations. And uh, the one leads to, okay, we should exploit output inflation trade-off. And here, no, forget about output inflation for a uh, trade-off. Rather, focus on stabilization on inflation itself. And then let's see what will happen in the real economy. Obviously, saying uh, wait and see what happens with, with a really uh, real economy won't be enough, but more to come. Still, <clears throat> uh, the turmoil of the 1970s led uh, to, abandon, to abandoning of the Keynesian macroeconomics. Uh, the models failed to provide reliable predictions, but what is important, uh, uh, providing reliable predictions was the purpose of those models. So the main goal which was promised by the proponents of those theories was missed, so there was no need to keep them alive. Second, there were theoretical counter-arguments, such as that the Keynesian models relied on ad hoc specification, rather than being derived from some theoretical framework, from micro foundations, and everybody would love to meet, uh, to meet the microeconomics with macroeconomics again. And uh, there's been also the uh, the arguments that uh, the formation of expectations is really trivial in Keynesian model and doesn't correspond to uh, the reality how the people actually think. So when the models were incapable to evaluate the changes in monetary policy, there's been a need for something different. And uh, why there was a need for something different is nicely expressed, or was nicely expressed by Robert Lucas uh, in his argumentation uh, being famous as called the Lucas Critique. Uh, Robert Lucas argues that uh, the large macroeconometric models of Keynesian tradition were unreliable because these models were not structural. That means uh, they were they came from estimated reduced forms with uh, unstable parameters, which were which were not policy policy invariant. The models which were estimated 
uh, to had uh, parameters that change together with changes in economic policy. As the behavior changes with changes in policy, then the parameters of the models change. And therefore, the models which are estimated on historical data and have perhaps a good fit there might not really provide and be reliable for predictions, maybe not just only for short-term predictions, but especially when trying to find out, uh, when trying to estimate the counterfactuals. That means when trying to estimate what will happen if the policymakers does this or does that. And this is something what economic models should deliver according to our expectations. What were the new models that were developed? Uh, the two alternatives which quickly emerged was first the Lucas model, monetary, monetary cycle model, and the second was the real business cycle models. There are two basic, uh, two main building blocks uh, and main assumptions of uh, those two those two generations of the models. The first is that markets are clearing continuously, so market is uh, always at uh, at uh, at the equilibrium. It, uh, agents and uh, <clears throat> uh, households and firms uh, optimize, so they choose the best available option given the information which is available to them. To them. And second, uh, firms and households uh, have fractional expectations, so they don't make systematic, uh, systematic, uh, systematic errors when they are trying to predict uh, and adjust to the, to the future. So the fluctuations, the business cycle fluctuations, according to those new equilibrium models of business cycles, reflect voluntary responses of rational agents. So it means that if the fluctuations are optimal, uh, uh, reflect the optimal responses, it, play, it leaves very little place for the governments to intervene because the governments, if intervenes, effectively will lead to, uh, to a less optimal, less optimal decision because of market clearing. It is assumed that, we, uh, that households and firms are able to, <clears throat> to reach uh, to reach optimal reaction by themselves. How such a models work in practice? So in Lucas monetary cycle, it is assumed that agents are rational, <clears throat> but however, sometimes are unable to distinguish between a change in the aggregate price level and a change of individual prices. So they somehow <clears throat> randomize and decide based on their experience and based on their assessment of the future, whether they believe that the changes in prices which they are facing to are changes in inflation, then they adjust their, price, their own prices, or whether they, <clears throat> whether they face just, uh, just some shift of inflation and then <clears throat> uh, just a shift to relative prices of different goods and they, uh, they don't adjust the prices at all. Uh, but then the optimization of future, the optimization in this model led to business cycle fluctuations, but those business cycle fluctuations were optimal. There has been still many money illusion. There has been still Phillips curve, or Phillips curve is still an outcome of the model, or a behavior which is consistent with Phillips curve. That means that uh, there still is positive correlation between inflation and output. However, this relationship cannot be no, cannot be exploited by the policymakers in the model anymore because then <clears throat> the agents will be able to. Uh, to to the money illusion will be lost because then everybody would expect that all the movements in uh, in prices would uh, would correspond to <clears throat> to shifts in inflation and will adjust their inflationary expectations. Uh, the model was tempting uh, in terms of that it provided uh, provided uh, interesting policy implications that seem to be in line with the experience of the 1970s. On the other hand, it's been hard to accept that money illusion, that on the one hand we have rational agents and on the other hand we rely on, on money illusion. This is something that is not really internally consistent in terms of philosophy of, uh, of the model, not in terms of the explicit assumptions which are being done. Still, there's been a need to develop uh, something better and the second generation of those models were the so-called two business cycles model developed by Edward Prescott and Finn Kindlon uh, from the University of Minnesota. 
Uh, in the real business cycle model, the main attention is shifted from monetary policy towards uh, towards supply side, towards, uh, and it is assumed that the economic fluctuations are driven by technology shocks, so by random perturbations that uh, uh, that uh, that appear from time to time, and the agents, uh, the firms and households are are again assumed to react optimally towards uh, towards the towards these perturbations. Again, there is no place for governments and uh, there is even no place for monetary policy at all and it is believed and the author spent a lot of energy trying to persuade uh, the audience that monetary policy has limited effects on output, which actually wasn't really confirmed in the, in the, subsequent, uh, in the subsequent period. <clears throat> what was the problem with this theory? Um, <clears throat> uh, no matter how intellectually brilliant it was. Uh, the problem was that uh, it assumed that uh, the business cycles were really driven only by technology shocks and uh, the technology shocks would have to be very frequent uh, to, to cause business cycle fluctuations that, uh, that we were observing. The business cycle fluctuations are represented here by the red curve, which is the output gap, which is a difference between actual output and potential output estimated using some filtering method. And uh, let's keep this uh, topic again aside. Simply, it's some trend in the trend in the GDP, and uh, the black line is estimated evolution using a semi-structural macroeconomic uh, macroeconomic model, and the orange line here, very volatile, very noisy, but with relatively few, for, with relatively low amplitude are the estimated technology shocks which should, according to real business, the proponents of real business cycle theories, cause, <clears throat> cause, the, cause the movements in business cycle. Just already here, when the American programs uh, or space programs started, is interpre uh, here appears negative technology shock. I don't think whether this is uh, really co consistent with the theory. I'm pretty sure, however, that the old shock here is something that came from abroad and which is hard to accept that it could be interpreted as a negative technology shock in the of the US economy. Then here, the beginning of the 1980s and the end of the 1990s is again, uh, again in being interpreted as negative technology shock, even though it's been associated with, uh, with a sharp disinflationary policies pursued by, uh, by Paul Volcker and that time the new appointed governor of the Federal Reserve Board. And we can then continue again and again. We would, for example, find support for positive technology shocks uh, in the 90s uh, and in the early 2000s, where, when, uh, when, the, when the IT sector started to boom. But we do not see very large positive technology shock here. Rather, we see here large negative technology shock associated with the early 2000s financial crisis and then with the 9-11 with the terrorist attack in, in Europe. So you can see here that the assumption that technology shock will try the economic activity is very, very strong assumption, which, uh, which is very hard to defend if you are critical, critical about, about, uh, about what, you, what you see here. Still, the RBCs were quite popular, <clears throat> as you can see on the table below. Uh, the RBC models here in the iteration from uh, by the uh, by Cogley and Prescott from 1995 were able to replicate the main features of the U.S. economy quite well. So here you can see uh, the the standard deviations uh, of uh, cyclical deviations of output, consumption, investment hours, and productivity, and here you can see the standard deviations, which was. Uh, which came from a simulated, uh, simulated business cycle models. The main features are being met. Consumption is uh, less uh, volatile than output, even though the baseline re your business cycle model predicts that it is really much less volatile, <clears throat> but it is correlated with output, which is good. Uh, the investment are more volatile than output, even though, well, that's also a good piece of news. Uh, the hours are slightly less volatile than output. And this is again, something what we can see here. So there is some success, the theory, even though 
uh, it's not super realistic. Provide some some uh, provide some reasonable quantitative uh, quantitative uh, predictions. Uh, it, it is able to replicate some of the stylized facts, but uh, the policy recommendations are obviously uh, driven by the assumptions which are there. So when the model assumes that money and prices have little importance of business cycles, then it means that um, <clears throat> that perhaps central banks uh, are not needed to, to put it in extreme. But uh, well, this is not really consistent with what we could observe because when uh, when the central banks really stop the expansion of money, the money supply, it usually leads to uh, decrease in economic activity. So. This assumption was too strong and it later led to a development of more sophisticated model that are able to, <clears throat> to deal with, uh, with monetary part of the economy as well. But uh, these models are still quite often compared with the benchmark real business cycle model just to see what are the differences and uh, what are the effects of the new flavors in this neoclassical model. Furthermore, uh, the policy implications of the models of the model are that uh, the business cycle has very little cost, that the economy is always an optimum, so that there is no involuntary employment. Gregory Menkew called the uh, called or made was joking on the theory by stating that according to RBCs, uh, the recessions are periods of chronic laziness rather than being periods of of, uh, of unemployment. But these models will be, but the new generation, the new Keynesian models will be, will be studied, will be discussed next time. Assessment. So to sum up, what are the main elements of the shifts in macroeconomics of the 1970s? The general equilibrium appeared as a dominant approach to macroeconomics. <clears throat> this means uh, perfect competition, complete market, rational expectations are now, you know, in the center of uh, most of the models that uh, that are used. Even though the later inter uh, the later <clears throat> later iterations introduced imperfect competition as well. The market failures are believed to be bad but unavoidable. However, uh, because the reactions to those to market failures or to potential perturbations are still considered as being optimal. That means the economic policy according to those models shouldn't really work as a shock absorber because if it tries to do so, the consequences for the welfare of individuals can be even worse. Uh, also, the models led to a development of complex macro mathematical models, situational expectations, dynamic optimization, and it's been said, it's been uh, the new good practice of macroeconomics and of economics as a, as a, uh, a, a, as a whole has been established and uh, it's been the general equilibrium economics. The outcomes of the general equilibrium models were also considered as universal or universal, so there stopped the need for country specific model. The only differences might have been uh, were supposed to be only in values of parameters. The revolution, <clears throat> the revolution of the 1970s uh, was not limited only on macroeconomics. There's been also a revolution in finance. Uh, Elgin Pharma and others uh, contributed uh, with uh, the development of the efficient market hypothesis, uh, which, uh, which is famous because it states that the prices of stock contain all available information on the market which has quite a dramatic in your implications. Not only it implies that it is impossible to beat the market with uh, some additional information, it also has the policy implications that the financial markets uh, can regulate themselves and the financial regulation can be left on the, left on the market itself because the market, financial markets are believed to be, uh, to be very rational. Finally, the, uh, the perspective on the state uh, changed quite a lot. So policymakers started to be, con <clears throat> be, uh, be considered as uh, being motivated by self-interest and there was no place for some internal motivation such as, the, such as that uh, bureaucracy in state administration might be people who just uh, want to work for a state due to their self-realization. Self 
we were talking about state failures that they started to become considered as a real problem. And then the positive role of the state for the economic development has been neglected. These changes thus set the path to neoliberal reforms of the late 20th century, which were based on promotion of uh, free markets, the regulation of national and international trade, the regulation of uh, financial markets, anti-inflationary policy, and neglected information of structural policies and redistribution. Um, let me also say that uh, these elements of, uh, of the shifts in macroeconomics in the 1970s also set grounds for the neoliberal reforms by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. <clears throat> and uh, together with Austrian school, uh, they, they shaped uh, the intellectual and economic environment of, uh, of the Western world in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last part of the 20th, uh, of the 20th century. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward for next meeting.